In the Lord Jesus Christ, as we turn our hearts and minds to read the story of God's coming into the world, please join me as I pray. Holy God, in the beauty and the safety and the warmth of the sanctuary, we are reminded of your steadfast love for us. Quiet us in body, mind, and spirit so that we might know your presence, hear your word, and be changed and transformed into those who reflect your light unto all we meet. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. This morning I'd like to read the passage from Luke's gospel that is assigned for today. It is Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. And I'll be reading from the Common English Bible, which is a little bit different than your Pew Bible, the New Revised Standard. Both are good translations, um, but it is the story of God's announcement to Mary. <clears throat> When Elizabeth was six months pregnant, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a city in Galilee, to a virgin who was engaged to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David's house. The virgin's name was Mary. When the angel came to her, he said, Rejoice, favored one, the Lord is with you. She was confused by these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The angel said, don't be afraid, Mary. God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father. He will rule over Jacob's house forever, and there will be no end to his kingdom. Then Mary said to the angel, how will this happen? since I haven't had sexual relations with a man. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come over you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the one who is to be born will be holy. He will be called God's son. Look, even in her old age, your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son. This woman who was labeled unable to conceive is now six months pregnant. Nothing is impossible for God. Then Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be with me just as you have said. And then the angel left her. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In church speak, today's scripture reading, the story that we just read is called the Annunciation. And this, it's the story of when God told Mary that she was going to give birth to a son that would be God's son. The word annunciation is a, sort of a, a closer derivative of Latin, right, Beth? That means the announcement. And so God makes an announcement through God's messenger Gabriel to a young insignificant girl in Palestine named Mary. The announcement is... Mary, you are God's favorite. God has blessed you. God is with you. And you have been chosen to carry God into the world. <laughs> now that announcement has been sung. It has been read. It has been memorized. It has been painted. And it is remembered in the long history of the Christian church as a key turning point in all of human history. Now, it's not the first time God had shown up, right? Because God had been at work before creation, since the rhythms of day and night were created. That God had been at work in the creation of and through all sorts of people. God had showed up both as a continuation of what God had been doing and also in this brand new, different way of showing up in the world. This is a story of a birth that's unlike any other birth that happened over 2,000 years ago. And it is also a story of the mysterious and mind-boggling way that God comes to us all. 
there are those, I've heard folks before, try to make this story of the announcement to Mary only a sort of a once upon a time historical event. And then there are those who want to make this into a moralistic lesson on virginity or sexual purity. Others want to make this into a social justification for unwed mothers. And in my opinion, those who try to box in this story in a very small space are missing the power and missing the point of the mystery of this story. Those who do so are missing the power and the mystery of God and how God worked, not only in Mary's life, but how God continues to work in our lives and in us and in the whole world. The story has to do with Mary, yes, but it also has to do with you and me, right here, right now. It's not just a historical event. It's a historical announcement, and it is also the story of the power and the presence and the purpose of God in our own lives. When God sent Gabriel to make that announcement to Mary, the first amazing and mysterious and strange thing about this announcement is that God favored Mary, not Herod. Not any of the political powers of the day. God didn't favor, at least in Luke's gospel, he doesn't tell the men first, he tells Mary first. God doesn't favor the learned. God doesn't favor the educated leaders of the day first. It wasn't the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees that got the news first. They aren't the ones to whom Gabriel shows up and says you're favored. It wasn't the rich. It wasn't the powerful, it wasn't the famous, it wasn't the people that the papers and the news channels all go to to ask them, what do you think about this current event? God favored Mary. God spoke to Mary and said, you are loved, and God is with you, and I have chosen you. In my office, um, just over my computer where I spend a lot of time these days, as do you, there's an artistic rendering of this announcement that was painted by Henry Osawa Tanner in 1898, one of the early African-American artists, son of an AME pastor. In 1898, Tanner painted Mary. After a trip to the Promised Land to visit, Tanner painted Mary as a Palestinian teenager sitting on the edge of her bed with her covers still rumpled and unmade as if she had just gotten up. And the angel Gabriel is simply a shaft of bright light. And Mary sits on the edge of her bed and gazes at this angel, this shaft of bright light, with a remarkable facial expression. It's, I read it as a, a mix of interest and puzzlement, wonder and openness. Some caution, but not really fear. And what Tanner's painting reminds me of is that God favors Mary because God favors Mary. You know? She's not favored because she's unusual. She has none of the old historic sort of halos around her head. She's a Palestinian teenager. She's favored because that's what God does. Mary is nobody. She's of no consequence. And in the same way, you and I are to read this story and to know that God favors us because God favors us. We are not loved because we're worthy. We're not loved because we're beautiful. We're not loved because we're accomplished. We've done lots of good things because we've given lots of money, because we can do something really well. We do not earn or deserve God's favor. God just favors us. When we feel really small and insignificant, when we fail, when somebody tells us we're not enough, when we seem to serve no larger purpose in the world other than washing the dishes and taking out the trash, this 
story reminds us that it is exactly to people like us that God comes and speaks. Mary received the message that God had chosen and loved and favored her in Tanner's painting, sitting on the edge of her unmade bed. And in this story, we are to see ourselves and place ourselves in that same spot. God looks at us with our bed head and our old mismatched pajamas and says, I know you. I love you. I choose you to carry God into the world. The other place where this story invites us into the power and the presence and the purpose of God is that we can see that when God comes and speaks to human beings, it changes not only our own lives, but it changes the lives of the whole world for the good. And lots of times that happens in ways we can't see, understand, or appreciate. When God chose Mary, you know, she, I guess she might have said, you know, why would I want to be chosen? I mean, I've got other plans for my life that don't include lots of diapers and sleepless nights, right? And at least in my own experience, and maybe I'm alone in this, but when God chooses me for a task, I am prone to resist. I don't necessarily want to be chosen or used. I, I've got my own plans. And I see this tendency, not only in my own heart, but it's all over Scripture. Scripture is full of people who resist being used or favored by God. I mean, for crying out loud, let's start with Herod, right? Resisted playing the part that God had given to him. And instead, he chose to protect his own power. And so you remember, he tells the wise men, come back and tell me so I can worship. And when they don't do that... He sends his troops out to kill all of the young children in and around Nazareth once he had heard that there might be a new king born of the Jews. Read Matthew 2.16 to get a real close-up view of how Herod resisted being chosen. And when, when God sent the angel to speak to Mary's cousin Elizabeth's husband, Zechariah, when the angel shows up to tell Zechariah that he and Elizabeth had been chosen and favored, you know how that story goes if you need to read it just a couple of verses, a couple of chapters earlier, a chapter earlier than this. Zechariah responds to this message, you've been chosen, you've been favored, by questioning the angel. You know, he, I get it. He wanted to understand more. He wanted, to, he wanted to know the details of the contract before he signed it. And for his resistance, Scripture tells us, Zechariah was unable to speak for the nine months of Elizabeth's pregnancy. And I love the way writer Kathleen Norris writes about this. She calls Zechariah's being struck mute for nine months, she calls that Zechariah's own pregnancy. <laughs> And she writes, Kathleen Norris writes this. She said, I read Zechariah's punishment as a grace in that he couldn't say anything further to compound his initial arrogance when confronted with mystery. When Zechariah does speak again, it's to praise God because he's had nine months to think it over. <laughs> the mysterious story of Gabriel's announcement invites us to reflect on how and when we have welcomed God's intervention, God's plan, God's love, and when we've resisted it, and when we've tried to control it, wanted to know the details before we signed the contract, tried to manipulate exactly what the outcome might be, and this story reminds us that whether we expect it or not, whether we understand it or not, whether we agree with it or not, whether we cooperate with it or not, God is coming. And God is working in the world to favor us and the world. And the last way in which 
this announcement of Gabriel to Mary invites us in is to remind us that God's coming really does not depend on us, that God is coming. There's an African-American teacher, Loretta Ross Gata, who wrote, Jesus told us, without me you can do nothing. That's John 14, chapter 5. And then she continues, yet we act, for the most part, as though without us, God can't do anything. We think we have to make Christmas come, which is to say we think we have to bring about the redemption of the universe on our own when all God needs is a willing womb, a place of safety, nourishment, and love. Oh, but nothing will get done, you say, if I don't do it, and Christmas won't happen. And we crowd out Christ with our fretful fears. God's coming, Scripture says, doesn't depend on you and me, but the good news of Scripture is that we are invited to participate. It doesn't depend on us, but we are invited. And each of us is invited to play our own small, sometimes they feel very insignificant parts. When we wash dishes, when we change diapers, when we go to work, when we teach Sunday school, when we tend our children or someone else's children, when we care for those who cannot care for themselves. And when we do those things like it's an imposition we, this story invites us to remember that in reality, it's our invitation to participate in God's favoring of us in the world. It is our invitation to carry God into the world. And the reason we read the story of the announcement every year is because Mary, unlike Zechariah, unlike many of us, accepts God's invitation. Mary looks at Gabriel, whatever Gabriel looked like, standing in her bedroom while she's in her pajamas, and she says, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be with me just like you've said. I am invited and you are invited. I am favored and you are favored. And none of that is so because we're really good, because we've really worked hard, because we're really important. But all of that happens because that's the kind of God that created the world and everything in it that exists. God's coming doesn't depend on us, but when we accept the announcement and when we respond to it in humility and in love, then even we... Even we get to participate in the cosmic and profound plan that God has for you, for me, for the whole world. It's a plan for redemption. It's a plan for love. And we are invited. And we are favored. Let us pray. Here we are, Lord. You are great and we are not. You are powerful and we are weak. You are steadfast and consistent in your love for us. And we are only able to manage to love in ways that are conditional and inconsistent. Here we are, Lord. Let it be with us, just as you have said. Amen.